past, by the present and the future, and you have our lives in your hands. You know about the storms of life that we have faced, the ones that we're facing now, and the ones that are coming, and you are with us. You love us unconditionally. You meet our needs. And our desire is to be more and more like Jesus. And Lord, as we gather together this morning, we have people here who have needs. Lord Jesus, the sick among us, those facing financial challenges, those who are praying for loved ones, Okay. <clears throat> 
about the Holy Spirit. We find out that the, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is our friend, our helper, especially when we're going through difficult times, heavy times, battles, storms of life. He's our helper and our comforter. The Holy Spirit is not weird. Look at that. People are weird. Let me, let me emphasize that. People are weird. The Holy Spirit is not weird at all. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit never brings attention to himself. He always uplifts the Father. Always. The Holy Spirit is the only one to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we took a good look at that. The Holy Spirit is God. And Pentecost is one of the three major festivals, and it means 50. We don't have to be fearful of the word Pentecost, okay? Let me emphasize this. The Holy Spirit is not Pentecostal. The Holy Spirit is not charismatic, okay? Keep that in mind. We don't have to be afraid of the word Pentecost. The manifestation of fire, wind, and tongues of fire is found in Acts, but also in the giving of the Lord on Mount Sinai. The giving of the Lord brings death. If you didn't fulfill the Lord, you die. But at Pentecost, grace was given. Grace was given. The Lord is written in the heart of the people, fulfilling the great prophecy of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. We took a look at why tongues of fire. And the commentary says, God, tongues of fire, God's purifying presence, which burns away the undesirable elements of our lives and sets our hearts of the people for and sets our hearts aflame to ignite our lives. In other words, you know, God is working. And through that fire, okay, he begin to eliminate those things in our lives. We also talked about the need to realize that God works through the spectacular. We use the example of Elijah, right? And we know about the Mount Carmel experience, how God worked, I mean, with incredible uh, special effects. God did not need Hollywood at all, but he came down with this fire. But we also need to recognize that God also works in silence. And sometimes, you know, and I was one of those individuals, I used to belong to an extreme charismatic church at one time. I was one of those individuals that if I didn't see a manifestation there that morning, you know, oh, the church was dead. Those people need Jesus. Very judgmental. <clears throat> you know? They need Christ. I'm looking at that. I mean, that place is dead. We need to respect and have reverence for God that many times he speaks through silence. A whisper. So Christ gave the example to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So the question number one is this. Can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes. But what's stopping you? What is needed in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And before we answer that question, let me emphasize two points. The first point is this. We have uncovered the lie by Satan that a cardinal Christian life is all that is possible. In other words, some people believe they're going to be cardinal Christians all the time. And there's no life and victory. They're going to struggle with that same sin forever. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Listen carefully. Nothing does more harm in the body of Christ, my friends, then the underlying thought that obedience to God is impossible. 
Have you ever felt that way? I will never obey God. I mean, I try and I try, but I keep failing, I keep failing, I keep failing. <coughs> Andrew Murray tells us, until we believers see the error of this and honestly view our life of continued failure as sin and an excusable, no amount of preaching will help that. To believe that you're going to continue to live in that sin and nothing is able to help you. That is not possible. That's a lie. <coughs> a major lie. Listen, God has made provision in Christ. Amen? Amen? And by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we can have a life of victory and rest and fellowship and be maintained by God. It can be realized. It can happen in our lives. But listen, it is only as we see clearly in the Word of God this life prepared for us that we can be encouraged to desire this life, to hope for this life, to believe in this life by faith. We need to see the transition, my friends, from the old life of stumbling and broken fellowship, you know, and, and take that moment. When we come to that moment, and, and people have experienced that, we come to that moment that we're being, you know, transformed by God, and we said, yes, this can happen. It can happen by an act of faith. Trusting him to work in us what we have failed to do ourselves. Let's use the example of the disciples. Christ trained them and Christ prepared them. <coughs> the disciples <coughs> excuse me, were men who had forsaken as the same word that Christ used at the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The same word. The disciples were men who had forsaken everything to follow Jesus. Abandon everything. That's what it means. Abandon everything to follow Jesus. Now what does that look like? Well, they left their home. <coughs> They extend their family, their work, their good name. They were mocked. They were laughed at for leaving all to follow Jesus. When Jesus was despised, when Jesus was hated, they were hated too. These guys were totally surrendered to Jesus to do his will, to go wherever he commanded. Listen carefully. The very first step in the way to the baptism of the Holy Spirit is this. We must forsake, we must abandon all to follow Christ. Didn't the bishop challenge us last week on the Lordship of Christ? Hey, I'm not talking about getting saved at all. Many believers think that when they receive Jesus, he saves them, and then he helps them in times of trouble. And you know what happens many times? Then they go on to deny him as the Lord. They think that they have a right to have their own will and their own way in a thousand things. They say what they want to say, do what they want to do, and use their property and possessions as they wish. They are their own masters and will never dream of saying, Jesus, Jesus, I forsake all to follow you. I know about that, do you? I know about that. Especially early in my Christian life. I was saved. And I want to say what I want to say. I want to do what I want to do. That carnality taking control. This is the command of Jesus. He says, abandon everything, forsake everything, if you want to follow me. If you want to follow me. He's the Lord of all we have in our. We cannot have him in us and with us unless we yield everything to him. 
And Jesus' words have not changed. Forsake all and follow me. Another point to think about is that disciples were not only men who left everything to follow Jesus, but they were intensely attached, connected to Jesus. And didn't Jesus say, if you love me, obey me, and I will ask the Father and he will give you the comforter in John chapter 14, verse 15 and 16. I mean, disciples, they saw him crucified. They saw him crucified. And their hearts could not be separated from him. They had no hope or joy or comfort on earth without him. And listen carefully. This is what so often is lacking among us. We trust Jesus and his work on Calvary. We trust him as our Savior. Yes. That is sufficient to bring us salvation. But do we have that relationship of an intense, a close, personal attachment to Jesus and fellowship with him every day? You know what I'm talking about? you have any, have any idea what I'm talking about? Yes, that relationship means that Jesus, the unseen one, shall be my friend, my guide, and keeper at all times, my leader and Lord whom I obey. Is your life one of tender personal attachment to Jesus? Is it filled of joy in your life? I'm not asking you if your love is perfect. I'm not saying that. I'm asking you if you can say honestly, honestly, it is what I am striving for, Lord. This is what I want in my life. What I have yielded myself to. What I long for above everything else, Jesus. This is what I want. I must have all of me on the cross. You with me every moment. third point is this. The disciples were men who came to the end of themselves. Yes, at the beginning of the three years of preparation and instruction, they gave up you know, what they possessed. But it was only at the end of that journey that they began to give up themselves. Are you following me? Let me make this more clearly. They had given up their nets, their homes, their friends, and that was right. But throughout the three years, they fought the battle against self. Does that sound familiar to you? How often Jesus spoke to them about humility, but they didn't understand it. I mean, how many times there was tension among them about who was going to be the chief? Can I sit at the right hand? Jesus, I mean, how many times? I mean, even the night before the crucifixion, they were still arguing. They were not willing to give up self. Self is one of our enemies. Carnality is another one. Damage emotions is another one. The world is another one. Satan is another one. But listen, here Christ taught them and he trained them and he revealed to them, time after time, what the sin of pride was. They struggle with that, do you? I do. I do. But pastor, someone is saying, pastor, I think I have given up all for Jesus. My property, my home, my friends, my position, and I think I do love him, but I still have not received the blessings of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is that you this morning? Let me ask you a question, a very difficult question. Are you willing to let the Holy Spirit with a searchlight 
to go into the basement of your heart or the attic of your mind and shine that light? Are you willing to let them deal with you the fact that you have a tendency of judging people? You're always comparing yourself with other Christians. And because they're not where you're at, you think that you're more spiritual. Think about that for a second. Have you come to that point? Have you? Listen, self is at work. And sometimes we think we're doing, I mean, boy, does that hit me. We're doing work for God. And we find ourselves running here and there, all over the place. And sometimes we do good works. And then we realize really that God was not in anything. We were just doing activity. Have you ever found yourself that way? How about humility and tenderness and gentleness that Jesus taught? Do you know what the death of Jesus really means? Jesus said to his father, in effect, here is my life, which has been precious to me. I have not given in to sin. I have given you all my life while on earth. Now I yield to you in death. I yield to you in death. He used the word, it is finished. He gave up his spirit. He said, into your hands I commit my spirit. And listen, because he gave up his life so entirely, and he passed through the darkness of death and the grave, God raised him up into a new life and new glory. Pastor, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to say, Pastor? Well, Morris tells us it was his death that was the secret of the resurrection. And my friends, listen carefully. If you want to be filled with the Spirit and the risen life of Christ, you must first die to self. The disciples were men who had lost all and were ready to receive all from God. And Jesus told the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise that my Father will give to you. What promise? The promise that they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, on the strength of the promise of the Father, they waited in united prayer. And this is what we must do. Wait on God in prayer. They waited. They prayed with one accord. I believe they had prayer and supplication, supplication mingled with praise. I see that in the book of Acts chapter 2, 42, 47. They expected something to happen. Oh, my dear family of God, it cannot be stressed enough the importance of expecting God to act. This message came at the right moment because Tuesday we need to spend time in prayer and speak. Lord, speak to us. What's the next step? I'm asking that question. God, two and a half years, June 2017, where are we going to live? We don't have a house. Where are we going to go? And that little voice over here begins to tell me, where's your God? You know? Is he going to be there for you? Where's that, where that voice coming from? And then this voice tells you over here, has the life provided for you all these years? Have an eye I've come to do? Remember the days in college when you didn't have one cent, you didn't have any food in the refrigerator, and you came and you with your wife, 
And you open the door and there was an exact amount of money to pay not only the bills, but to, fight, to find bros to buy groceries. Did I come through many times for you? Why do I, you doubt now? Oh, this, this message convinced me. I'm with you in the pews here. I'm with you. It convinced me. Convinced me. My friends, the disciples didn't meet in the upper room, upper room to discuss how they were going to escape because they didn't want to get caught. They were not meeting together to discuss what was the next leader, who was the next leader. After all, they had that discussion many times. They were not meeting together to discuss the new gifts they were going to have, nothing like that. I believe as they met together to wait on the Lord and pray that they remember the words of Jesus, like, who is greatest among you? Let him be servant of all. I believe that they talked about, you know, remember the Sermon on the Mount? Remember when he talked about, like, loving yourself and, and loving others and loving your enemies? Remember that? Oh, my friends, as they gathered together there in that upper room, it was one layer of self after another layer that was removed. Another layer after another one was removed. Unto self was finally crucified at the cross. At the cross. You see, when you wait on the Lord and you pray diligently, the Holy Spirit will start to fill you as carnality, as self in the world and his pleasure is crucified at the cross. I have to be honest with you. We're too attached to this world. We are. We are too attached to this world. The impact of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Christ is no longer outside of them. For literally filling their hearts and thoughts and affections. They are empty of themselves and now Christ is beginning to fill them with his love, his power and authority. They're beginning to understand what Paul says. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. They began to understand this I, the flesh, been crucified with Christ and it is I Sometimes I have a problem with this light that I can't see clearly here. Well, you let them go blind. But if I no longer than live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live, that's the life in Christ, I live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Did you follow that? Remember, their life was full of failure and weakness. But now they're filled with, hallelujah, they're filled with the might and the power of the living Jesus, the Savior from sin. So let me ask you a question. Is that what you desire, you hope for, what you want in your life? I'm finishing here. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they had that relationship with not with God the way it should be. They forsaken everything. They abandoned everything. Right? I mean, they put self on the cross right there. But they have this non relationship. They have a relationship with self. They're beginning now to deal with the issues in their lives. Not only do they love God, but now they have an issue with their own life. They're beginning to deal with those damaged emotions in their life, those issues that get in the way. And here's the third, the third one. They have a relationship with other people. And of course we know that, you know, we have different, you know, personalities and temperaments. And sometimes, you know, people do things that rub you the wrong way. Uh, let me tell you, let me tell you clearly here, okay? Jesus made it clear to us, they will love me, 
by the love they have for each other. And if I have to say this, this is one area in the church, you know, that Christians deal with. They justify the actions, and I include myself there, I've done it. And sometimes they love people and do good to people that love them and do good to them. But people, you know, their enemies, what Jesus talked about, when he says, you got to love them, you pray for them, you help them. And when there's bitterness and resentment in the body of Christ, it brings division. And I pray this every day, Lord, keep this church from a divisive spirit every single day. But you have to ask yourself, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, is there tension, friction between you and someone else? No matter what they have done, are you willing from your heart to eliminate the bitterness and the resentment and say, if I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God, there's no way I can hold this against that person. There's no way I can't. Now, don't come saying, well, you know, I forgive, but I don't have to hang out with them. Gee, I don't think Jesus said that. I don't think he said that. <coughs> he made it clear. Because this is an issue in our lives and in the church life that has divided many churches throughout history. Many churches have been divided because of this. And God is challenging us. Are you for real? Do you really want my spirit to fill you? Do you know what you're asking for? Do you realize what's going to take place? It requires you to love your neighbor and your enemy. And there's no substitute for that. And I tell you, I tell you, there, there have been times in my life, instead of giving a blessing to someone, I wanted to give them a right hook. <laughs> You're the first one I'm going to get. <laughs> books 
uh, this book is no longer a text. Uh, Andrew Murray's book. That's a loose arrangement. I wish I could get off a bunch of them. Some this? Yeah, so at the beginning, to get about 10, 15 of them and give it to you and start reading this book, you cannot read it without conviction. Without conviction. I'm sharing with you what I've learned, what I've been applying. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, forsake all, abandon all, die to yourself. Let Christ, who's already victorious, live through you. And you will be filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, remember the old chorus, this is our desire. Oh God, to worship you. To worship you in spirit and truth. To live, Lord, a life full of your Holy Spirit. When, Lord, we're convicted, easily convicted. When you check, Lord, our, our relationship with you, with ourselves and with other people. Oh, God, so many things are happening. The enemy, I mean, he's causing havoc all over the place. And, Father, we need an army. An army that puts on the... The, the full armor of Jesus Christ. The full armor. And Lord, take a position and stand firm in what we believe in. Our hope is on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Nothing else but Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us when you bring conviction to deal with it and move forward, not to leave it. Father, sit there, Lord. But Father, that you bring it to the, to the top of our heads, Lord, and our minds. And Father, convict us. So Lord, because we want to live holy lives, set apart for you. Help us, Lord, with individuals that we have a hard time with. Help us so much, Lord, that, Father, we will come to the moment that actually we pray for them. Then we do something good for them. And that's hard. That's very hard. But it's only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're here with us. And I believe you have challenged every one of us this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Dad, that's where we're at. We come to this place right now and we have to say, Lord, it's time to surrender. I've done it my way for so long. But I choose now to surrender it all. I choose now to lay down my sword, to lay down my agenda, to take up yours. I surrender my life. I surrender my control. And I give lordship to you. Would you come, Father, and would you take the broken parts of me? Bring healing into my life. Walk with me. Lead me into your ways. Into your life. So that we can say like Paul did, it is no longer I that live. But indeed Christ, you live in and through my life. Take every vestige of our pride and burn that out of us. Every bit of that confidence we put in the culture of our day Every bit of that, of the lie 
that the culture is pushing upon us. Burn that out. And may we follow your truth. Lord, just like you called Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldeans. And you said, put one foot in front of the next. So this morning, Lord, we stand at the gateway and we say, Lord, I choose to take the next step. I don't know where it's going. I don't know where it's going to lead. But I trust you. And so I'm stepping out. Father, would you be with us in the midst of that? Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let your presence rest down upon us. And Lord, would you speak into our hearts? Well done, son, daughter. Move on with me. Well done. Lord, we want to give you our lives. Lead us today. Lead us out from here into that life with you in the midst of the culture of our day. May we be a shining light in a world of darkness. We give you thanks in Jesus' name.